Hi, I'm Code Fu, aka John McDowell, and we're going to talk to you today about real-world Flutter lessons for federated plugin development, learned from years of experience developing Stadia's gaming platform. Why do we care about this subject? Stadia's goal is one place for all the ways we play. Or better put, we want Stadia to be as ubiquitous as YouTube is, be it on phones, TV screens, desktops, and all the creative places our users have installed our app. Reeds and my team have years of experience working with cutting edge Flutter features. We've condensed our experiences into the following lessons to share with you today. What is a federated plugin? Using protos to communicate between layers. Not using magic strings or numbers in your code. Avoid using platform branching UI logic. And some bite sized tips. But first, I'll let Reed explain what a federated plugin is. Let's start by describing the different areas of a plugin. There are three high level parts app facing, platform interface, and platform specifics. App facing is the idiomatic Dart API surface you want your Flutter code to use. Platform interface is what needs to be implemented by every platform and is not visible outside of the plugin implementation. Platform specifics, or more verbosely, platform implementation, is your code that implements the platform interface. This is the code that can depend on and call platform specific methods. This diagram helps with visualization. As you move down this slide, you have your app-facing API, any shared business logic, then your platform interface, with each individual platform implementation underneath. We realize that as a plugin builder, it's our responsibility to think about what we want our Dart API to be, independently of how that API needs to be implemented in the platform layer. For me, this is the aha moment. Build the API you want, then figure out how to implement it. In this example, we want to expose a future string, but the value of that string is only available from some native platform method. To calculate the value, we'll trigger the evaluation by using our platform interface. Then, after the computation is done, our native code will use the platform interface to trigger on value calculated, which completes the completer. Anyone who calls this plugin does not need to know that the string comes from a callback or even what platform API we depend on. The caller has a Dart method that they can use like any other, and our internal use of completers lets us abstract away that implementation detail. We learned a lot after developing our first few plugins. Let me hand it off to CodeFu to share some more of those lessons. Thanks, Reed. One of the lessons our team learned early on. When sending messages across a boundary, you should use protobufs to handle the essentials of encoding and decoding. Protocol buffers are Google's language neutral platform neutral, extensible mechanism for serializing structured data. Think of XML, but smaller, faster, and simpler. You can learn more at the following link. In this example, we map our hypothetical streaming plugin communications with a simple proto having a start and stop game call messages. Each plugin message encodes exactly one plugin message we wish to send over, say, a method channel. We do not expose these protos to our users of our plugin. They are simply serializing communication between Dart and a native code. On both sides of the channel, we don't need to concern ourselves with the order or type conversion. We run a simple protoc command to code gen Dart files from our protobuf. As an added benefit, when following best practices, protobufs help with things like version skew and backwards compatibility. Their use can lead to a longer, happier developer life, even when not dealing specifically with plugins. For example, when writing configuration files to storage in an older app and then reading them in a newer app. If parts of your app, however, are shipped independently, for example, our firmware for decoding video streams, you'll experience version skew. Lesson two, avoid magic strings or numbers. Magic strings are strings you end up copying and using in multiple locations. In federated plugins, this could end up being in multiple languages handled by Flutter's method channels. If you find yourself copying and pasting strings, numbers, color codes, or any other basic item, consider this. You may occasionally have a typo or a missing capitalization. Not something I've ever done. This is an easy to find bug when it's early in your initialization, but depending on your plugin complexity and flows, it could be triggered much later in your app lifecycle and only be on one platform. Instead, considering putting all your strings in say, one place, a text proto, and using tooling to code in your way to safety. This simple platform constants file could be used by a parser to read in strings and integers used by multiple platform implementations. By defining a simple text proto, 
we can write once any number of constants and have all the magic strings output cross language header files, Dart files, Java files, and more. This can be hooked up to your build system to automatically update local files in your plugins. What's more, auto-generated constants will give you code completion in your editor. Or do whatever you like. We're not trying to be prescriptive with protobufs. It's just a tool that we use day in and day out. Feel free to play around with package source gen and Dart annotations, or use the pigeon package. We've discovered that the most expensive form of testing is integration or manual QA testing. Protobufs allow us to unit test either side of a plugin and remove a common source of errors. Want to make a strong caveat? Feel free to prototype rapidly as possible early on when defining a plugin, but settle on CodeGen before productionization or working with other teams to expand your federated reach. It really depends on your team size and your plugin size. Another lesson we learned was that there are many situations where you want your app to behave differently, depending on platform or form factor. The naive solution to these problems can lead to hard to maintain code. I'm gonna pass this off to Reed to cover that topic. Thanks, CodeFu. Let's first talk about why you might want to branch. You might branch because some piece of functionality is only available on one platform. That could be because of an inherent limitation on the others, or because you're actively developing a feature and not all platforms are implemented yet. You could also branch because you prefer a different experience on a different platform. The issue we found was that mixing functionality and preference made code harder to maintain, especially when something in the system changed. What if a feature was added or removed in an updated version of a plugin that we depend on? Or the OS added permissions for a feature we already built? What if we landed functionality one platform at a time? We need to audit the entire code base and find when we branched and why for each specific change in functionality. Months after a feature is built or after the original engineer has moved on, it can be difficult to understand why code that checks for the current platform cares in the first place, especially if there's no obvious missing functionality. In this example, download files depends on a plugin that has been implemented on Android, but not on other platforms. When the action is null, text button shows the button as disabled. This example is pretty simple with a single platform check, but we've found that checks can get more complicated. Like when we add support for a second platform, notice how iOS now supports downloading files. Or when we add a second UI treatment, this time removing the button in a different area of code. But you don't want to duplicate code, so you make a utility function. Then we take advantage of a new permission in Android 11 for managing external files. Then Flutter adds support for a new platform, like the web. This is another change in the system. As an app developer, it's awesome, so good, to get another platform for minimal work. But if you wanted to do a demo of what your existing code base looks like on a new platform, we need to audit all the places we branch and make sure the new platform follows the paths that are correct. In this case, the web supports downloading files, but not the expanded feature enabled on Android. So what is our solution? Capabilities and policies. We have found that separating out capabilities and policies has helped us branch code while minimizing the complexity branch code presents. These layers live above your plugins, in your app code, and give you a testable and easy to maintain way to branch UI. Capabilities can describe what the code can do. If you ignored your capabilities check, you would expect your code to fail. Policy covers what your code should do. It represents your organization's preference and can change when your team changes their mind safely. So how should you structure these concepts of capability and policy? That depends on your team, its structure and preferences. However, I'll give you three options to consider. You can have a single class, add methods to your plugins, or have one class per feature area. A single class can make usage easy and is the example I'll show in a second, but it can be unwieldy if you have a lot of code. Methods on a plugin that expose what it can do will help if you maintain the plugin, but if you use plugins maintained by others, you'll need some way in your app code to make those determinations. One class per feature area can work, but it might be overkill depending on the size of your code base. To back whatever structure you use, I again offer three suggestions for when you should evaluate either capabilities or policies. Compile time, runtime, and or RPC backed evaluation. We use all three. Let's talk about why you might choose each. Compile time checks are good for platforms where the policy or capability is unlikely to change, 
or accidentally changing the value might have large consequences. For example, if a platform does not have some piece of functionality, or a distributor requires you use a specific payment provider given the content of your app. Even if your code could launch a web view to take payments, the policy says you shouldn't. Runtime checks are required for determining capabilities that can change based on the device running the code, like if there's a touchscreen that the user can use. RPC back policy changes are good for incremental feature rollout, app deprecation, or for decisions that might change later, like a landing page for a customer support link. Fetching these values could be a new call to your backends, or you could take advantage of Firebase Remote Config. Here are some examples we have in our code base that I think helps with understanding the concepts. Requires Bluetooth permission. This check is true on Android S and above, and on iOS 13 and above, because there's additional UI that explains the need for Bluetooth permissions and makes sure that they're granted by the user. Has touchscreen, requires a system feature on Android, and is supported by all of our targeted iOS clients and supports the web devices based on their max touch points. On the policy side of things, allow purchase URLs is false on iOS to align with their app store guidelines, given the content of our app. Preferred input type is used when there are multiple connected input devices and determines which one should be chosen by default. This varies a lot per platform. Let me give you kind of a rundown. On TVs, we prefer controllers. Phones and tablets prefer touch. On the web, we prefer keyboard and mouse unless there's a touchscreen and the form factor is small. All of this can be combined with additional business logic that says the active input type is the input that's most recently used, but preferred input type helps set the correct default until the user takes some action. It's one of those pieces of invisible code that just makes the experience be what you want it to be. Here's an example using a single class version of the capability we discussed earlier. We use dependency injection to get the capability service. This is critical because it means that writing tests, we can provide a mock and check any branching behavior without having to run our tests on different platforms. In this example, similar to the bad example I showed before, the code base we're working in has added the ability to download files for some platforms, but not all. When not supported, the button appears disabled just like before, and users can't click the download if they're on a platform that doesn't have the functionality yet. This might be a good experience if you're trying to quickly show off what your code base might look like on a new platform where the goal is to highlight the functionality that would still need to be built. For example, if you wanted to see what a Flutter app previously targeting mobile might look like running in a browser. In this example, we have a policy for if purchase URLs are allowed. Note the policy layer doesn't evaluate purchase URLs and it still relies on your engineer to know that this is a concern for external URLs. In this case, we're assuming the support page will eventually go to a page that accepts payments, and that isn't okay on some platforms. Notice here that the UX treatment is very different. We're changing the content displayed to a shorter URL that is easier to type into another device. In addition, changing the behavior of the button from launch URL to copy to clipboard. This is so powerful. If your team has dozens of places where you come up with specific UI treatments that change the behavior, those places don't need to know about where the code is running. Every branch can be unit tested, and if you add another platform, or if your preferences change, it's easy to make sure your behavior is consistent with your past self without having to reevaluate all the code and the decisions you made before. Now back to CodeFu to talk about some bite-sized tips. Bite-sized tips. Make your life easy. Check pub.dev. There are many plugins that are already available, and you may not have to write one. Keep your business logic in Dart. Share it cross-platform and try to think of your native implementation as fulfilling a thin contract. Native exceptions are hard to trace. Rethrow platform exceptions as wrapped typed exceptions for better handling in Dart. And articulate what happens if you call your code where functionality is missing. Just don't crash. Let's quickly recap what we covered today. We learned the basics of what a federated plugin is. We covered communicating between Dart and platform code using protobufs. We shared some ways to define constant values between plugins and avoid the pitfalls of magic strings. We examined why we should avoid the branching and UI code. And we shared some bite-sized tips. We hope that this helps you build powerful federated plugins. Thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm.